Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jeannie Garbarino, the Director of Rocket EU Science Outreach at the Rockefeller University. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to Talking Science. Although we had hoped to gather on campus, this year's Talking Science is again being held on Zoom. The silver lining of hosting this event virtually, of course, is the ability to include more people than we could ever fit into our auditorium. Today, we have more than 550 participants. This includes students and teachers from 86 schools, as well as parents and science enthusiasts. We have people from 17 states, as well as participants in countries including Canada, Switzerland, India, Ethiopia, and Brazil. Namaste, salam, hola, fruitsi, and hello. Welcome to all of our new friends and welcome back to those of you who have participated in the past. We are gonna spend the next 75 minutes considering today's timely topic, infectious disease and immunology. Rockefeller experts will discuss their research on some of the world's most challenging diseases, their impact on society, and measures taken to better understand and prevent them. We are very grateful to Christian Gabler, Jeremy Rock, and Leslie Bossel for joining us today to shed light on the global health crises called, caused by tuberculosis, malaria, HIV, and now COVID-19. But before I introduce our first speaker, I want to tell you a little bit about Rockefeller University. Rockefeller was founded in 1901 by John D. Rockefeller, who recognized that the major barrier to preventing and treating diseases is a lack of understanding of the fundamental causes. The university was created to bridge this gap. For the past 120 years, our mission has been science for the benefit of humanity. Rockefeller is unlike other universities. We have 70 laboratories and a small research hospital, but no academic departments. And we are a university for graduate students, meaning that students on our campus have already received their undergraduate degrees, so they've attended university or college, and have come to Rockefeller to earn their PhDs or MD-PhD degrees. There are approximately 200 graduate students, so these are students who are on their way to earning their PhD, and they work alongside more than 600 other scientists who range from postdoctoral fellows. So postdocs are the people who, um, after they get a PhD, they want to uh, gain a pathway to independence a little bit more. So they do sort of like a second PhD, and that's a postdoctoral fellow. And that, and then you span all the way to the professors who head the university's laboratories. Over the years, Rockefeller has been the site of many scientific breakthroughs, including the landmark finding that DNA is the basic material of heredity. Our investigators have also discovered the hormone leptin, which regulates appetite and energy metabolism. They discovered the immune system's dendritic cells, which are crucial for fighting infections, infectious agents and cancer. And they developed combination therapy that transformed HIV infection from a rapidly fatal disease to one with a normal lifespan. As one metric of our success, there have been a remarkable 26 Nobel laureates in medicine and chemistry at Rockefeller since our founding, including two who received their awards in the past five years. In 2017, geneticist Michael Young was awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine for his discoveries about the molecular mechanisms of circadian rhythm, the process by which our sleep-wake cycle and metabolism are regulated and coordinated with the Earth's 24-hour day-night cycle. And in 2020, virologist Charles Rice received a Nobel, uh, a Nobel Prize for research that made possible the development of a cure for hepatitis C. Today, scientists at the university conduct a broad spectrum of basic and clinical research, and their investigations touch on almost every disease or health condition you can think of. But we do more than conduct great science. We believe that science for the benefit of humanity also includes sharing our science with students and teachers. In fact, Rocky DU Science Outreach works year round to present fun, authentic science experiences to thousands of students across this city and now through the virtual platform, The World. You can find more about these programs and other science learning activities on our Rocky DU website, www.rockefeller.edu forward slash outreach. Talking science is a very special part of a tradition of Rockefeller scientists giving back. We are deeply grateful to the Andreas C. Dracopoulos Family Science and Society Initiative for providing the generous support that enables us to present this year's exciting program. All right, now let's get to it. It is my pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, Dr. Jeremy Rock. Dr. Rock is an assistant professor who joined the Rockefeller faculty in 2018 to head a new laboratory of host pathogen biology. 
He studies mycobacterium tuberculosis, the organism responsible for tuberculosis, which is the leading cause of death due to infectious disease. Tuberculosis is an ancient and, as you will hear, notoriously intractable disease that has developed a resistance to the antibiotics used to treat it. The Rock Lab employs an array of technologies, including functional and chemical genomics, to understand the mechanisms that enable tuberculosis pathogen to survive and persist once it infects humans. The lab's ultimate goal is to make TB treatment faster, more effective, and less likely to permit the evolution of antibiotic-resistant organisms. Dr. Rock will give a brief overview of tuberculosis and its bacterial origin, how it's treated, and ongoing efforts to reduce the global disease burden. If you have questions during the talk, please submit them using the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We're, we're gonna actually hold the questions until we have heard all three of our pre presentations, and then we'll get to as many of your questions as we can in the remaining time. All right, it's now my pleasure to welcome Jeremy Rock, whose talk is titled, Before There Was COVID, There Was and Is Tuberculosis. Jeremy, thank you so much for being here, and uh, I look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you so much, Jeannie. Uh, I'm excited to, to share with you today the, uh, our lab's passion, studying the human disease tuberculosis. It's uh, really nice to, to share the airwaves with, with COVID. Um, if COVID's the, the new kid on the block, uh, TB is definitely the OG. So I'm excited to share with you today. Uh, let's see. To start a laser pointer. Nope. I switched over. Okay. Perfect. So, uh, what is tuberculosis or TB for short? Uh, as Jeannie mentioned, TB is caused by this bacterium called Mycobacterium tuberculosis. And one thing that's fascinating about this bacterium is it's an obligate human pathogen. There's no environmental reservoir. It's not like cholera that can live in the ocean or salmonella that can live in, in poultry. The only place that uh, this disease lives is inside of us. We are the petri plates for, for TB. TB is primarily a disease of the lung, uh, but it can infect essentially any organ to which the bacterium disseminates, the liver, the spleen, the eye, the bone, pretty much anywhere it can get. And uh, because of its ancient nature and uh, the number of different organs that this bug can uh, colonize. It's a disease of many names. In the 1700s and 1800s, they called it consumption or the, the white plague. Uh, the ancient Greeks called it physis. Uh, pos disease is TB of the bones. Scrofula is, is TB of the cervical lymph nodes. So it's, uh, this disease has, has many, many different names. And if you are unfortunate enough to acquire uh, TB, and don't treat it, it has about a 50% mortality rate. So it's a very deadly disease. Uh, how old TB is, is actually still a very active area of, of research, but uh, current dating uh, puts this disease about somewhere between 5,000 to 9,000 years old. Uh, but molecular epidemiology can go back and, and, and look at, at uh, ancient Egyptian mummies, for example, and find evidence that uh, uh, these people were afflicted with TB disease. So uh, suffice to say that TB is, is an ancient disease, uh, that is for sure. What does it look like? So here's the bacterium. This is Mycobacterium tuberculosis. It's a rod-shaped bacterium, about two to four microns in length and about a half to one uh, micron in, in width. And it's always fascinated me, and this is a theme in all of infectious disease, that something so small uh, uh, can have such an uh, outsized impact on, on human biology. How do you get TB? Uh, well, you get TB from someone else who has uh, TB. So if you're near someone who has active tuberculosis, that's uh, TB in the lungs, uh, that person can cough or sneeze or sing or breathe or whisper, uh, and they will expel these uh, uh, droplets, these liquid droplets that uh, contain bacteria. And so what happens is these uh, 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 small droplets containing the bacteria, you are near this person and you inhale these uh, micronuclei is what they're called. And they travel down into your lungs, into the, the terminal branches of your airways, the alveoli, where these bacteria uh, sit down and then they are 
uh, eaten uh, or phagocytosed by immune cells, primarily what are known as uh, alveolar macrophages here shown in blue. And the goal of, or the job of these cells is to eat these invading bacteria and to kill them. And what's particularly fascinating about TB is it is able to subvert this response. So what happens is these immune cells eat the TB bacterium, uh, but can't kill it. And then they migrate into the interstitium of the lung and the bacteria begin to replicate in these macrophage cells and ultimately kill that cell, which results in the recruitment of more uh, immune cells and which is just more food for the bacterium. And ultimately, you end up with uh, the formation of this hallmark of TB, what's called a granuloma, which is this walled off uh, cavity of immune cells and, and bacteria. And typically, this results in a stalemate between the immune system and the bacterium. About 90% of the time, a person gets infected with uh, TB and they'll be latently infected. Uh, so they will not progress into active disease. But about 10% of the time, uh, over the course of the lifetime of this person, they will develop what's called active TB, the lung form of TB, and then uh, continue to transmit this disease within their community. So as I mentioned, one, one thing I find particularly fascinating about this bacterium is it has evolved to live inside the immune cells that are dedicated to, to kill it. So this is a scanning electron micrograph of a macrophage eating a clump of, of TB bacterium and what would normally happen is these bacteria would be, uh, the macrophage would undergo sort of stereotype processes to, to kill these bacteria, but TB has evolved ways of evading those processes. And these, these are human macrophages here stained in, in blue and uh, TB bacterium stained in red. And you can see these uh, macrophages can be chock full of, of TB. So TB again has evolved uh, to use these immune cells as basically their home. It's a niche for, for their growth uh, and, and development. So uh, if you get active TB disease, uh, how do we treat it? Well, about 1500 years ago, um, you could go to the king or the, the queen and they would uh, uh, do what's called the royal touch or, or the, the king's touch and they would place their hands on you and by the divine power invested in the royal family, attempt to cure you of that disease. And I, I wasn't around 1500 years ago, but I suspect this treatment probably didn't work that well. Uh, if you fast forward about 1400 years, uh, I didn't appreciate this when I began in this field, but there's a history of TB disease in, in my not too distant family. This is my grandmother, Virginia. And this is her uh, uncle, Ernest Richter, who unfortunately passed away of TB in, in 1932. And we actually still have his doctor's notes and prescriptions for uh, how they were supposed to treat his TB disease. I won't go into any detail, but uh, the medical treatment in the 1920s and 30s for TB consisted of, uh, you can't wear a belt, you have to wear suspenders, uh, you have to sleep outside, you must sip but not drink three pints of milk, cod liver oil, mustard baths, these very, very detailed and extensive uh, notes on, on how to treat TB that again, ultimately, unfortunately, weren't effective. A couple of decades later, though, the situation improved quite uh, dramatically. So in 1944, uh, the first antibiotic uh, success that could successfully treat TB was discovered. It's called streptomycin discovered by this man, Selman Waxman, over at Rutgers, right across the river. And that ushered in sort of the golden era of antibiotic drug discovery. And even today, uh, in 2022, drug-sensitive TB is treated with this combination of four drugs uh, I list here. And this uh, was a uh, really, uh, there was a tremendous sense of optimism uh, in the field at the time. And Selman Waxman, who won the Nobel Prize for discovering streptomycin, uh, uh, wrote the ancient foe of man known as consumption, the great white plague, tuberculosis, or by whatever other name, is on the way to being reduced to a minor ailment of man. The future appears bright indeed, and the complete eradication of the disease is in sight. So we really thought uh, that TB was going to be a thing of the past. Um, so I think it's fair to ask, is TB still a thing? Uh, and even less than a month ago, uh, Tucker Carlson tweeted out that, you know, there's a 
tuberculosis outbreak at Goldman Sachs in, in New York City. And he said, you know, now it's not a huge deal because tuberculosis never killed anybody. And it, it's easy to kind of give Tucker Carlson a hard time here. But I think that's fair. Tuberculosis is not a disease that's at the front of the mind of, of uh, many people in the Western world. So is TB still a thing? And unfortunately, uh, the answer is, is yes, TB is still very much a thing. It, it remains a, a global epidemic, uh, particularly in places like Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. Uh, even uh, actually this year was the first year in a decade where the uh, TB incidents and, and deaths actually went up because of difficulties in getting care with COVID. But, uh, you know, it's about 10 million new active cases of TB per year, one and a half million deaths about half a million drug resistant cases per year and about a quarter of the world is thought to be latently infected. Okay, so uh, what are we gonna do about it? Uh, so we're an academic lab here at, at Rockefeller and uh, we work with other academic labs in the Gates Foundation and pharmaceutical companies uh, to try to find better ways of, of targeting this bug. So we are very interested in understanding how the, let's turn this laser pointer back on, how the bacterium interacts with the host, right? How does it grow in these macrophages? How does the bacterium interact with the drugs that we have to try to treat it? And then putting the triangle together, how does an infected host, uh, how does the bug interact with the drugs in the context of, of chemotherapy? So the, the types of questions in my lab is interested in uh, addressing, I'll, I'll touch on the last one in a little bit more detail, but. Like I mentioned, what are the features that allow TB to grow inside of a, a mammalian host? This is really a, a fascinating uh, evolution, and, and can we understand the biology of this? Uh, we do have drugs to treat TB, but how do they actually work? Some of them we really have no idea. Uh, and as Jeannie mentioned, drug-resistant TB is becoming an increasingly uh, difficult issue to deal with. So uh, how, do we, how is TB actually evolving to become uh, resistant to these drugs, and uh, how can we try to avoid that? And lastly, I'll touch on a little bit is, can we find new, better drug targets in TB? It's, it's clear we're gonna need new antibiotics to treat this disease. So how are we gonna find them? So uh, the way that we have approached uh, this question is uh, to leverage new technology, right? So when uh, Jennifer Doudna and uh, Emmanuel Charpentier uh, discovered this uh, CRISPR-Cas9 uh, enzyme, which I'm sure you're all, all familiar with, this is a, a landmark event in, in, in biology. And what was so beautiful about this uh, Cas9 enzyme is you can program it to recognize any sequence of DNA that, that you want. So it's incredibly powerful. And, and what a, a brilliant scientist here at Rockefeller quickly realized is that you could uh, mutate this Cas9 enzyme, and instead of being a pair of molecular scissors, now it's simply a DNA binding protein. And now you could program, uh, uh, the name was Luciano Marafini, I forgot if I mentioned that, program this Cas9 enzyme to bind anywhere in the genome that you want and use it as a way of turning off genes. So uh, the way that this system works is normally if you have uh, your gene here, right, in the central dogma, your uh, gene, your DNA gene is transcribed into mRNA by RNA polymerase, which is then translated into protein. And what you can do is you can put Cas9 down on your gene and it blocks RNA polymerase from transcribing your gene. So it shuts down production of that mRNA transcript. And this is a transcriptional interference mechanism, right? Cas9 blocks RNA polymerase from transcribing a gene. And when we read about this, we became very excited that, you know, can we try to apply a similar approach in TB? Uh, that turned out to not be a, uh, a trivial process. Nothing is in, in TB disease, uh, but we developed this uh, method to turn off different genes in, in TB. And then we're able to ask the question, well, if we turn off a gene in TB, does the bacterium die? And, and could this be a good drug target? And what was kind of neat about this method is uh, not only could we turn a gene off, uh, but we could uh, do it in a graded fashion. So typically in most genetic approaches, you can have a gene that's off or you can, or on and you can turn it off. It's binary, right? It's a light switch. It's either on or it's off. But with this uh, Cas9 uh, CRISPR-based system, what we could do is we could basically turn it into like a dimmer switch, right? Where instead of being off or on, we could turn the gene down a little bit and ask, does the bacterium die? And turn it down a little bit more and does, uh, ask, does the bacterium uh, live or, or die? 
And we thought this could be a very powerful way of finding new uh, drug targets by trying to find those genes in the bacterium that are the most sensitive to inhibition, which are the genes where we only need to turn them down a little bit in order to kill the bacterium, those could potentially be great drug targets, right? So if you have a drug target like this gene, uh, uh, drug target number one, you need to turn that expression of that gene down way down, almost off in order to kill the bacterium. That's gonna be a tough drug target because you're gonna need a small molecule that really get a lot of inhibition of that target. As opposed to drug target number two here, where you only need to turn down expression of that gene a little bit in order to impose uh, in order to block growth of that, that bacterium. So that, in effect, is basically what we've done in this paper, and it's open access. Uh, anyone can go take a look at this. Uh, where we did this at genome scale, we can look at every potential drug target in TB and ask which are the ones that are most vulnerable to inhibition. And, and now what we're doing is we work with uh, the Gates Foundation and, and different pharmaceutical companies to try to help them pick uh, the next best drug target in, in TB. Uh, so TB is very bad to get, but it is fascinating to work with. Uh, so like I mentioned, it's an obligate human pathogen. We work in a biosafety level three. So the authors of that uh, paper that I just described are, are Barbara Bosch, a PhD student in my lab, uh, and Michael De Jesus, a computer scientist, both of them in their, their native environments. And um, that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Uh, solid Gandalf shout out uh, and fantastic talk. Um, I see that we have a question uh, in the Q&A. Uh, I invite all of you to continue submitting your questions as they come into your mind. And you can write them down in, in a notebook or just plug them into uh, the Q&A box and we will address as many as possible in our upcoming Q&A session. All right, our next speaker is Dr. Leslie Vossel. Uh, Dr. Vossel is the Robin Chambers Newstein Professor and Head of the Laboratory of Neurogenetics and Behavior at Rockefeller. She was also recently named Chief Scientific Officer of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, one of the largest private funding organizations for biological and medical research in the United States. And I know many teachers out there are probably using a lot of HHMI materials. I know my AP bio husband loves uh, the materials up there, so very cool. Dr. Vossel is a neuroscientist and a geneticist who studies sensory systems and behavior. Much of her current work is aimed at understanding the molecular neurobiology of host-seeking and blood-feeding in mosquitoes. Female mosquitoes require a blood meal to complete egg development. In carrying out this innate behavior, mosquitoes spread dangerous pathogens that cause diseases like malaria, malaria dengue fever, Zika, and yellow fever. Today, Dr. Vossel will discuss how many mosquitoes, how mosquitoes find and bite people, and why some people are more attractive to mosquitoes than others. There, these issues that she and her colleagues have been working to understand uh, in an effort to stop the transmission of devastating infections. Please welcome Dr. Vossel for her talk, Mosquitoes, the World's Most Dangerous Animal. Thanks, Jeannie. Um, do you see the presentation? Yes. Yes, um, you're good. Perfect. So it's my great honor to be here today um, with this great lineup. Um, and you heard a really wonderful introduction from Jeremy Rock um, about uh, the uh, pathogen tuberculosis. Let me just turn this thing off. Great. So I'm going to talk um, about uh, the creature that actually gives humans diseases rather than the diseases themselves. And so we're really interested in how mosquitoes find and bite people. And this is something that um, many humans want to avoid uh, in our hemisphere where mosquitoes are just annoying. So you can go onto Amazon and buy these outfits for your hiking exploration in mosquito infested woods. Um, kind of a ridiculous getup. And you'll notice that there is a fatal flaw to this product, um, which is that um, the hands are completely unprotected. So if these people having spent $100 each on these um, mosquito suits go out um, into the wild where they are, um, the mosquitoes will find their hands and bite them. And so uh, people for as long as there have been people have been trying to figure out how to not be bitten by mosquitoes. So I wanna start with the pathogens that the mosquitoes do spread. Uh, everybody in the world is now an expert on virology. It's been like a bright spot of the pandemic that where everybody's interested in science. And so this is the RNA virus SARS-CoV-2, which is spread by people. Here's a picture of a beach outside of Boston in July um, 20, 
20. And you can see that this one individual who got the message to wear a mask, but everybody else here is potentially transmitting a virus from person to person. What makes mosquitoes different in the pathogens that they transmit is that the pathogens go back and forth between mosquitoes and humans. And so, as Jeremy said, tuberculosis lives um, only in humans, pathogens such as malaria and the many different flaviviruses that the mosquito we work on transmit um, are uh, replicated both in the mosquito and in the human. And so the mosquito that we work on does not spread malaria. This is Aedes aegypti. Um, these animals spread RNA viruses that are unrelated to SARS-CoV-2, but have some of the same biology in common. And so by this act of a female puncturing this person's skin and filling her belly with blood, she's able to get the protein that she needs to produce eggs. So here's some structures of the viruses that uh, Aedes aegypti spreads. These are terrible viruses, but very pretty. I find the structures really beautiful. So this is yellow fever. This is a very old virus that has been around uh, and been sickening humans for a long time. So a fun fact is that um, right before um, the 1800s, uh, the yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia um, killed more than 9% of the residents. So something that swept through at the time that they didn't know that mosquitoes were spreading this. So it wasn't, until some time later that people figured out that it was mosquitoes that were spreading this pathogen. Zika was a virus that came into prominence in around um, 2013, 2014, uh, popped on the scene uh, and uh, started sickening uh, people with autoimmune disorders. Um, and then these devastating birth defects that pregnant women um, uh, encountered with their fetuses and their babies. And so this is the Zika virus. Dengue is another terrible um, emerging tropical disease um, that infects an estimated 300 million people every year. Um, and then lastly, chikungunya, which is not known, it's not as famous as the others, but um, was first reported in humans um, in the mid 20th century and causes um, fear and severe joint pain. And what's interesting is that if you click back, which I'll do right now, um, yellow fever is a very old virus, it's been described for centuries. Zika was only uh, described in humans in the 1950s. Dengue is a bit older and chikungunya also came in about the 1950s. And the lesson is that mosquitoes are very good at picking up viruses. Humans are very good at transmitting viruses uh, to mosquitoes. And we have to keep our eye on the birth of new viruses that will go on to be um, the next emerging epidemic as a reminder that SARS-CoV-2 is a novel coronavirus. And so mosquitoes are, of course, waiting to pick up these pathogens. And so this is a heat map of the globe, the probability of occurrence of Aedes aegypti in the world. You can see here the southern United States um, has had sustained transmission um, of some of these tropical diseases. And another fun fact is that malaria spread by a different species of mosquito wasn't eradicated in the United States until the 1970s. So although we always think of these mosquito-borne diseases as a problem of Southeast Asia, um, South America, or the African, subcon African continent, um, in fact, the United States um, has also had in the Southern parts that are hospitable to mosquitoes has had these um, diseases. And as the globe warms due to the climate crisis, this heat map will move north northwards. And so more of the areas that will become amenable um, to the breeding of mosquitoes. And so these diseases will also begin sweeping northward. So as I mentioned, a really important fact to remember is that only female mosquitoes bite and feed on blood. And they strongly prefer to feed on us, not on non-human animals. Um, and they do this because without this blood source, they are infertile. So they need the blood to produce offspring. Here's a male at the side observing the female. Uh, males don't have the will to bite and they don't have the syringe like appendage on their heads to be able to puncture skin. Another fun fact is that mosquitoes don't um, feed only on blood. So female mosquitoes on their, when they're not in need of blood for producing eggs, will feed on floral nectar. And that's the sole source of nutrition for, for males is nectar out in the wild. So it's this incredibly sexually dimorphic behavior only females uh, find and bite people. And so 
probably all of you have experienced this unless you live indoors um, in a mosquito-free zone. So here's a sped up movie of mosquitoes biting someone in my lab um, who has exposed a small um, circle of her skin. All the rest of her arm is covered by a latex glove. And you can see that the females have rapidly found this very tiny piece of exposed skin. They have punctured her skin and they're filling up on her blood. And so in the act of doing this, if this person had been infected, the females would fill up on infected blood, vice versa. If the person were not infected and the mosquito were, the mosquito would then inject the pathogen into this person's bloodstream. And so that's this back and forth and back and forth ping pong game of mosquitoes um, acquiring and spreading diseases. What does this look like underneath the blood? Here's a movie of this syringe I talked about, this stylet that is underneath the skin looking for a source of blood. So this amazing sensory structure, it looks like something that has um, the intelligence to be able to detect um, this little capillary. And so then here you see that the stylet has actually punctured the capillary and is drawing blood. Recent work from my lab has asked, what is this structure doing? How is it sensing blood? And so here's a movie of the stylet um, where we have taken all of the neurons um, and uh, put a protein in them that responds with a fluorescence burst when the neurons are activated. And over here at the right, you'll see drops of blood, a drop of blood containing blood cells that's gonna be detected by this um, stylet. And so just pay attention to some of these cells. There's a huge drop of blood and you see that a subset of the cells become really excited by the blood. There's gonna be another drop of blood. You see that a few cells are really excited by the blood. And so we imagine when the mosquito is underneath our skin, this is the organ that's sensing it, getting super excited and telling the mosquito to begin drinking blood. So again, unless you um, are lived in a sealed airlock, you have all been bitten by mosquitoes and you know how incredibly persistent they are. So we think of them as pursuit predators. They're not predators, they're called micro predators because they don't kill us by feeding on us. We call them micro predators. And so I'm gonna think a little bit about how are the kinds of behaviors that they um, are exhibiting uh, putting humans in danger. And so pursuit predators um, have to do three things. So they have to detect the prey. I'm gonna use this model of this big cat um, in Africa. So here's the big cat detecting the prey. It's see looking out on the savanna and finding the prey. It then has to pursue it. And this can be a really difficult task. So here's the predator, here's the prey. This is pretty representative of what the hunting situation is for this big cat. So even though the cat is big and fast, the gazelle that it's um, trying to kill um, does big, fast, evasive maneuvers. Um, and it can be difficult to maintain contact, visual and other contact on the animal. And so the animal has to know when to persist or abandon pursuit before it captures the prey. And so we've been thinking a lot about this. Why are mosquitoes so, pes so pesky? How are they so motivated? And so um, Jeannie mentioned why are some people more attractive to mosquitoes than others? And I can tell you that first the mosquito needs to detect us and that's achieved by the exhaling of the breath of this person. So the CO2 strongly activates the mosquito, which then flies toward the person um, driven by the body odor that the person emits. And then finally, there's body heat that gets them excited um, and then visual contrast. So there's really very little you can do to avoid being um, targeted by these micro predators because you can't stop doing any of these things except to stay indoors. And so we've been interested in how these animals are so persistent and how they know when to keep hunting or to give up. Um, and so here's an example of what pursuit detection looks like. Here's a bunch of mosquitoes in the lab in this box. We've activated them with carbon dioxide. Um, and so then they uh, have detected the prey and here they are pursuing the prey. In this case, not a human, but a warm surface area on the side of the cage that they are trying to bite. And so we'd like to know in our work, how long does this CO2 induced prey detection persist in the mind of the mosquito? How long should the mosquito persist in hunting the person or abandon it? So you might imagine, if the human is outside breathing and if they then go indoors, the mosquito would be an idiot to continue uh, pursuing the person 
for hours because they may not be around anymore. And so, but if they only pursue them for 30 seconds, that might not be long enough because um, maybe they're still in the local area. And so we've been using um, a tool that's that's been broadly important uh, in neurobiology called optogenetics. Jeremy talked about CRISPR, which is the biggest thing in molecular biology. Optogenetics is the biggest thing in neurobiology. It allows you to take membrane proteins derived from algae that are activated by light and um, gate occurrence. So we put this protein into neurons that respond to carbon dioxide. We turn on the red light. The red light activates this ion channel. Sodium goes into the cell and the neuron gets super activated. So if we go back to that picture I had of the neurons getting activated by blood, we can effectively activate the neurons with light, sort of a mind control in the mind of the mosquito. And so what Trevor did was, as I said, he put this um, optogenetic gene into all the neurons that express a carbon dioxide receptor, turned on a red light, and then asked what happened. And so here's a cumulative picture of the animal in the 30 seconds before the light was on. Here's the mosquito hanging out here in this little box. In the 30 seconds after the light, you can see if you superpose all of the different images of the mosquito, it has gone crazy and is all over the little box. And so that's quantified here. Now, is this activation enough to trick them into feeding on a human? Um, and so we activate them uh, with uh, light and we ask, will they start um, feeding on the blood that's underneath this little area? And indeed, you can see that these animals are kind of hanging out. They're not very activated. These animals have become activated and you can see that they're swelling. So their bellies are filling with blood. And so this suggests that we can indeed activate the CO2 neurons of these mosquitoes and trick them into thinking that blood, um, that, that, there, that there is a human presence. And so here's just a picture of um, the incredible amount of activity that activating um, these animals with a pulse of red light. So we're tricking them into thinking that there is a human presence. We wanted to then um, look at the individual mosquito. And so we put these animals into these little boxes where we can, um, with really high resolution, figure out what they're doing. What kinds of behaviors are they exhibiting? Are they exhibiting prey detection, prey pursuit, or prey capture? And so in this video, um, we also used um, machine learning to be able to track um, using all these little dots that are on the different body parts of the mosquito to figure out what the animals are doing. So here, the timer is going to count down. And at time zero, we're going to turn on the red light. The animal is going to think that carbon dioxide is hitting its brain. And you can see that they start getting activated. They start flying. They start walking. And they start probing. So these females really, really think that the CO2 has given them the detection of the prey. They're now pursuing it, um, and they're trying to capture it. And so this machine learning um, evoked setup allows us to really get a sense of what these animals are doing. And uh, machine learning is also the biggest thing in biology at the moment. So as I said, we were able to put these little dots onto the different appendages and the software is able to predict, is the animal flying, walking or probing? And probing is that behavior where they put their stylet underneath the skin. And so we can see that when we hit them with this fictive CO2 or the, the red light going on, we see this massive increase in um, walking and probing only in the case where the animals have all of these different genes in them to where the red light is able to activate their behavior. And so if I plot that out in time, um, if we turn on the red light, we see again this huge increase in walking behavior um, and probing behavior that lasts over the course of 10 minutes. And this begins to answer the question of how long will a mosquito, after it has detected the prey, continue to pursue it? And so we see this incredible persistence in the behavior where a five second pulse of light will convince the mosquito that there is a human in the neighborhood for up to 10 minutes. And so that's a really amazing discovery that these animals are persistent. We know this from our lived experience, um, but we have demonstrated this here with biological experiments. If we do an experiment where we give them a sense of fictive CO2, this is the really cool thing where we turn on a light and the mosquito feels like it has sugar in its mouth. 
you don't get this persistence. So if you look at walking um, or probing, there's a little blip of that and then it goes back down to baseline. So it isn't the red light by itself that tells them that there is a human there. It's the red light that activates um, the carbon dioxide neurons. And what's really, really important is that a female that's already had a blood meal does not care about humans. So if you're in a house where all the mosquitoes have already bitten somebody, you're safe, they're not gonna come after you. Whereas the hungry mosquito that, um, that hasn't had a meal is going to come after you. Moreover, males are not gonna come after you. And so we did this experiment both in females that are hungry, females that already are satiated with blood and males. And you can see that this fictive CO2 has absolutely no effect on females that are already full of blood or males. Only in the females that are actively hunting can you induce this fictive CO2 persistent behavior that again lasts for 10 minutes. So in this last part, we wanted to figure out how long will the sense of hunting live in their minds. And so we set up this opto feeder where an unfed mosquito or a fed mosquito here um, can be examined. And so we can show that a brief pulse of fictive CO2 that's delivered here, let's say 20 minutes before the blood meal is offered or 14 minutes before the blood meal is offered, we ask how long can the mosquito remember? Ah, in the recent past, I smelled the prey, I smelled the CO2, which in this case is uh, fictive CO2 induced by light. And the answer here with these red bars is that if you give them the fictive CO2 at the same time that you give them um, the blood, they will, many of them will feed. If you give it to them two minutes or eight minutes or even 14 minutes in the past, they will um, uh, basically take this uh, blood meal mimic. And so that says that the female is able to keep in her mind this persistent stimulus of a human uh, for 14 minutes, which is an incredible result. And so what I've shown you here today is that carbon dioxide um, is the prey detection um, moment, which we can use optogenetics to give the females the sense that they've smelled a human breath. They then use odor, visual cues, heat, and taste um, to try to pursue the prey in this noisy sensory environment. You're like flapping your hands, trying to get the animal to stop biting. You may be running, you may be hiking. Um, and so they know to pursue this prey, we think for at least 14 minutes. And that is what makes these animals such incredibly effective micro predators. And the answer, which you can read all about it on this paper that we put on BioArchive last week, is that increased concentration of carboxylic acids on your skin is what makes those of us who are very attractive to mosquitoes, mosquito magnets. And so with that, I wanna highlight that Trevor Sorrells did all of the work on the micropredation and thank my wonderful laboratory. This is us um, earlier um, in, in a, at the end of, I don't even know what year it is with the pandemic. Okay, 2021 um, in July. And we have many, many, many high school students who have worked in our lab um, over the years. And so when our labs reopen, um, please definitely consider training in one of our labs. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna stop uh, screen sharing um, and thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Leslie. Those videos were absolutely beautiful. Um, your lab does such cool work. Okay, so our final speaker of the day is Dr. Christian Gabler, an assistant professor of clinical investigation and the Robert S. Wennett Fellow in the Laboratory of Molecular Immunology, which is headed by Rockefeller's Michelle Nussenzweig. Dr. Gabler is a physician scientist interested in antiviral immunity and the development of immunotherapy for viral infections. Much of his current research focuses on immune system cells in the body that are infected with HIV, the AIDS virus, but are not actively producing new virus particles. These cells can constitute a, res a reservoir of latent virus that antiviral drugs cannot seem to reach. Dr. Gabler will discuss his work on antibodies and HIV and how that research jump-started more recent studies of COVID-19 and the SARS-CoV-2 virus. His talk today is titled, Antibody-Based Therapies for HIV and COVID-19. Thank you for being here, Dr. Gabler. Thank you so much, Jeannie. And let me get started. First off, let me say what a cool talk by Jeremy and Leslie. So interesting to learn about hangry female mosquitoes. 
But I'm excited today to talk about antibodies. And more specifically, I want to talk about methods of identifying antibodies that can then be used as potential medicines for infectious diseases such as HIV and COVID-19. And so when I started preparing this talk, I, I, I was looking for an easy way to depict the complex system that is the immune system. And I, for some reason, I always came back to a show that I loved what, like growing up as a kid. And I think it was this German or French TV show that basically showed all the little miracles that were happening in the human body. Uh, and on a side note, um, throughout our careers, we were always asked to write those motivation letters. And I, I remember in my motivation letters, I always came up with fancy explanations why I want why I became a doctor, why I was interested in that. And honestly, I think 95%, the real reason is, or at least 95% was this cartoon that I watched as a kid. So let's let's look at it. So what do we see here? We see this, this bearded man. Uh, he was the one who was in charge, who controlled everything. So he was representing the brain. Then we have these little red people carrying these bubbles of oxygen running through our blood vessels. So these are the red blood cells. We have this little um, bad guy, this little fly, which represents an invader. So some form of bug, a, a germ. And then we had the heroes, at least in my opinion, the heroes of these of this show were the these patrollers in their white flying vehicles, and they represent the white blood cells, which are the immune cells. Let's take a closer look at them. So we have this this patrol man. He has a thumb up. So uh, my interpretation is this is a so-called T cell, so a specific type of immune cell. And then we have this patrol woman here in her white vehicle. And on top sits this little tiny creature, which has the hands up and actually represents an antibody or a B cell receptor. And I actually really like this depiction of, um, of an antibody because when you look at the real structure of an antibody, which is this Y shape, the top part of an antibody um, is the part where it actually detects or holds on to a foreign substance, uh, parts of a virus or a bacteria. So these are represented by the hands of this little creature it holds on. And then you see the bottom part, um, which are the feet here in this creature. And the bottom part in the, of an antibody is responsible for engaging other parts of the immune system, interacting with other cells. So like this creature could run and, and ask for help for, um, from other immune cells. And so what actually happens? And let's stick to these cartoons a little bit. So every day our body encounters um, a lot of invaders, let's say parasites, worms, bacteria, viruses. And in order to stay healthy, we need our patrol cells um, to keep us from getting sick. And so what we have in our immune system is these B cells, they have those preformed antibodies on their surface. And these B cell, the B cell receptors or antibodies, they detect small parts of those uh, invaders, of those bugs. When they do that, um, they go look for help and they get help from the so-called um, T helper cells. So they interact, these two types of immune cells interact and the T helper cell gives some stimuli, stimulation to the B cell for what's next. And what's next is a B cell can become either a plasma cell, which is an antibody producing cell. So you see those here, these vehicles produce a lot of antibodies that are ready for attack. Or, uh, and that's important for later on, um, a part of these cells um, then goes on to become a memory cell. That's a neat trick that our immune system has it prepares ourselves for a, a potential future encounter of the same pathogen of the same germ. Uh, and then we already have those cells that are ready to go in case we encounter it again. But when we have those plasma cells, they produce the antibodies that can then attack these invaders and pinch their tongues and, and neutralize them. And so now you might ask yourselves, like, it, it seems like an, an abstract concept. What is an antibody? How did we even find out about antibodies? Like, how do we know that these things are in our immune system um, exist? And that's a very good question. And when you look at, um, um, or when we want to answer this question, I think we have to go back roughly 130 years towards the end of the 19th century. And back then, there was a disease that was very common. And uh, I'm using the past tense here because lucky for us, this disease is it's still around, but it's not as common anymore. And this disease is called diphtheria, um, or it was sometimes also called the strangling angel of children. What you can see here in this creepy, creepy painting. And what this type of um, disease is, it's caused by a bacterium called Carinobacterium diphtheria. Uh, and it's a bacterium that is easily transmitted through respiratory droplets. And these bacteria can infect the mucosal lining of the throat of the tonsils, and they can excrete a toxin. And in some forms, in, in, in mild cases, it causes a sore throat, 
but these toxins can also make it harder to breathe for people. And they can also, when they enter the bloodstream, attack other organs of the body, for example, the heart, and they can be very fatal. And so a German doctor, Dr. Bering, and a, a Japanese doctor, Dr. Kitasato, um, towards the end of the 19th century, they made some very interesting observations and very important experiments. And they did these in guinea pigs, so in, in, in study animals. And what they saw is when they had a guinea pig that survived an infection with um, this bacteria, when they survived diphtheria, and when they took the blood of this animal, and they took the liquid part of the blood, the serum, and transferred it to another animal that was still sick and still struggling with the disease. This serum that was transferred would actually cure the other animal that was still um, fighting the disease. Uh, and so they called it that something in the serum of this recovered animal, um, they called it an antitoxin or later on an antibody, helped the other animal um, to fight off this disease. And this observation was really remarkable because um, back in, in the day, this, this disease was very fatal. So one out of two patients would die from it. But within a short period of time, within years, um, this observation by um, Dr. Bering and Dr. Kitasato would actually become standard care. So the, ser the, the serum therapy that they um, observed and tried the first time as an experiment was actually becoming standard care. And it led to a, a, a rapid um, decrease of fatality in cases of this diphtheria, diphtheria. And the way this was um, acquired, this um, anti-diphtheric serum was by horses actually. So even pharmaceutical companies would immunize horses with small amounts of um, this toxin of this bacteria, would then collect their blood, take the serum of the blood and would administer the serum to patients. And they would then um, in many cases um, uh, could survive this disease. So obviously um, a lot has happened since. Uh, now I'm gonna fast forward quite quickly and under the umbrella of um, this big term molecular biology, what happened over the last century um, and many of these, um, as we already heard from Jeannie, many of these advances actually took place at this, um, at this same institution where we're sitting here today. Um, we had advances in bi biochemistry, of microbiology, virology, genetics, um, physics, and all these things, if you put them together, we now learn so much more, or we know so much more about the immune system. And fast forward to today, or let's say 10 years ago, um, um, also, um, newer methods that um, uh, regarding the isolation and identification of antibodies from um, human B cells were pioneered here at Rockefeller in Michelle Nussenzweig's lab. And I want to take some time now to walk you through um, to hopefully at the end of my talk that it's not going to be such a black box anymore, but talk you through and walk you through an example how we use such newer strategies for COVID-19. So how do we generate monoclonal antibodies from human B cells? Uh, and again, it starts with recovered individuals in this case. So obviously not uh, guinea pigs, but for coronavirus and SARS-CoV-2, the disease, uh, the virus that is causing COVID-19, uh, we were looking for individuals who recovered from COVID-19. How did we do this? Um, we got the word out, we printed flyers, we asked around and we wanted to, in early 2020, we wanted to bring people in that had recovered from COVID-19. Uh, and we brought them into our little research hospital and to the university hospital at Rockefeller University. Uh, and then we take their blood. Uh, and in the blood of these recovered individuals, we're looking for a very specific type of cell. And I mentioned it earlier, we're looking for memory B cells. So B cells that had encountered a certain pathogen, in this case, SARS-CoV-2. But you can imagine that in the blood, there are millions of B cells. Um, we encounter so many different viruses, bacteria, throughout our lives. So we need to very specifically look for those that we're interested in. So we need to go fishing basically. And in this case, we use a bait. So we not use a worm or a fly. We use like a little part of the virus that we're looking for. So in this case, we use the small part of SARS-CoV-2 and we color this part with a fluorescent dye. Uh, and then we try to fish out those cells that we're interested in. And we're not using a, a fishing rod for this, but we're using uh, a cool machine, which is called a cell sorter. And I'm gonna show you how this machine works. And this machine allows us to isolate these individual cells um, into these tiny little Petri dishes. And so this is the machine. Um, you see, it looks pretty unspectacular from the outside. This is Christy, our technician who knows um, a lot about these machines, probably more than anyone else. Um, what you can do in this machine, you can load a cell suspension up here, then it goes into the 
machine and this machine sorts and can individually put out these cells. So you see here the cell suspension, different cells. We're interested in those that are green, labeled green here. So what this cell sorter can do, it can capture size, can look inside the cell, and it can look for color of cells. So it runs the suspension of cells through the machine, and then it shoots little lasers at those cells that are running through the machine. And then some cells that are labeled with the color give us different signals can detect the signals, then create an electrostatic field, and then separate very individually these cells that we're interested in. And it can do that even in an, in an individual cell into one of those little Petri dishes. So these machines are actual sorters, so they help us sort these cells that we're interested in. And once we have them here in those little tiny Petri dishes, um, we can then go on. And um, as I mentioned early, um, the B cells that we have, or the, the B cell, the responsibility of a B cell is to produce antibodies. So they're filled with the genetic information that they need to create um, antibodies. So what we can do with PCR with DNA amplification techniques is to amplify this genetic information, uh, to sequence or so learn the genetic code of this genetic information. Once we have the code, uh, we can do different things with it. We can put it, for example, in another construction plan and produce those antibodies that we just um, that we just isolated the genetic information from. So how do we do this? Um, for this, we also use a, a, a neat trick. So what we're doing here is we take this genetic information, we put it into a construction plan, and then we have a, a cell line, a so-called cell line. Here, this is in a tissue culture dish. Um, these are adherent cells. They can also be done in suspension cells. And then we try to to trick those cells into producing the antibodies for us. So we put the genetic code for these antibodies on, we give them what they need, we, we give them the right temperature, we feed those cells, and then after a couple of days, like a small factory, these cells actually produce the antibodies for us that we can then isolate, uh, and we can try to measure them. And with fancier techniques, um, electron microscopy, crystallography, we can then even look at the structures of these antibodies and really make them um, visible. And in our case for COVID-19, we detected two very interesting antibodies um, that had different ways of detecting the virus. You see this part of the virus here in gray. And then we tried to, to go further with these. And we really, um, as you remember, um, COVID-19, and it still is uh, a global pandemic, and we were in the urgent need to find therapeutics for it. And so how do you bring something from a lab that we just found in the lab into a clinical trial, into clinical research? And this is a, a very complicated um, a process that I'm just summarizing in one slide. So let's go quickly. We found something. Then you usually test it in small animal models. Um, then you could go into larger animal um, before you might be able to test it for safety in, in a human clinical trial. Before you can do that, there's a lot of regulatory processes. So you first have to check this clinical grade product of the antibody for chemistry, the manufacturing, you have to test that it's not toxic. And there's a lot of paperwork, uh, rightfully so, right, um, involved before you can then hopefully start testing these antibodies in a clinical research trial. And we've actually done this with these antibodies that we uh, identified. And at some point, when you go through all these processes, we were able to hold these actually clinically created product in our hand that we could put into a syringe and test for safety um, in um, human beings. And hopefully with the hope that down the line, they could be used as therapeutics or preventative um, medicines in, um, uh, for COVID-19. And so without going into the details here, what you see is like a clinical course of COVID-19. So once you have viral replication, then depending on the, the severity of the course of disease, um, different forms of symptoms. And what I just wanted to show down here is um, the types of treatment options that we had. Um, more recently, they changed a little bit. We had an addition of some antiviral treatments that came up here, which we're really thankful for. But in the beginning, it was really only um, monoclonal antibodies um, that had the potential to prevent and uh, treat. We took a, a hit for antibodies with the newest variant around with Omicron, but there is still at least one antibody formulation that, um, that is able to treat and prevent COVID-19 against Omicron infections as well. And I think this, um, as my last slide, I just wanted to show how, when you think back to um, horses and the experiments that Dr. Bering and Dr. Kitasato 
made um, around the last um, or around the, around the end of the 19th century, when we look um, what these newer understandings of the real um, inner workings of biology brought us, that towards um, the, the, the um, 2000s and 2010s, you really see an up rapid increase in antibody based treatments for any disease. Uh, but more specifically for infectious diseases, you really see that these newer techniques gave us a, a, a lot of newer antibody-based treatments, especially in the last two years for COVID-19, but also other viruses like Ebola, um, rabies, and HIV. So there's really um, uh, an increase in those treatments, and it's an exciting field, and I'm, I'm happy to take questions um, in the Q&A. And there are very many people to thank because this is a long process, as you can tell, and, and I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks so much, Christian. All right, I'm gonna combine some questions that I um, saw in the Q&A, and this one is for you, Leslie. Um, can you describe the relationship uh, that, does mosquitoes provide any kind of beneficial relationship to the human species? And how can we think about the relationship uh, evolving um, as climate change starts to take hold of uh, Earth. Uh, those are great questions. So, um, you know, you could look at it on the one hand that mosquitoes um, kill a lot of people and sicken a lot of people. So do we really need them? Should we eradicate them? And uh, I'm never a fan of eradicating anything except smallpox was a good thing to eradicate. I think the kinds of pathogens that Jeremy and Christian work on are good to eradicate, but mosquitoes are more skeptical of. So they do provide um, a link in the um, in the food web. So they're used by fish and frogs. Um, they have an aquatic stage. So um, that's why you shouldn't have water around your house. So in the aquatic stage, they're a huge source of food for um, fish, birds, and frogs. Um, and in the adult stage, they're sort of incidental um, pollinators along with bees and flies. So I'm not a fan of killing them all. I'm a fan of managing them. And then as far as climate change, mosquitoes need water to breed and they need reasonable temperatures so they don't overwinter. And so that's why as the globe warms, um, as long as you have those two, those three factors, humans, water, and a reasonably temperate climate, we will have much more mosquito-borne disease. And I'm gonna follow up with one extra question. Um, as we think about more mosquitoes potentially inhabiting more areas of the globe due to climate change, how do we think about repellents? Uh, how do repellents currently work? And um, are we gonna be okay with the repellents that we have moving forward? So you saw in my opening slide, the, the, the one way to avoid mosquitoes is just wearing, you know, window screens or wearing this, this full on mesh. Another way to avoid them is repellents. And so there's a number of products that you put onto your skin that have some efficiency, but they're difficult products because you have to spray them. You can't miss a spot. If you have any spot that's not covered, um, you will be bitten. And so the question of how do repellents work is it's an area of active controversy in our field. So there's not yet really a consensus about how they work, believe it or not. Um, we know it has something to do with the sense of smell. So when the mosquitoes are coming up to you and you're covered with um, an insect repellent, they're either going to smell that and find it disgusting or the smell of the repellent mixed with the smell of your body odor is going to confuse them. There's no controversy about the fact that when you have a repellent and they land on your skin, that they really find that deeply aversive. So um, if you cover yourself well, if they get through the haze of the smell of the insect repellent and they land on your skin, you'll be protected. But none of these measures in isolation will protect us from mosquitoes. So it's managing the populations by getting water um, not having water for them to breed in, um, wearing clothing, insect repellents, knocking down the populations, and ultimately um, vaccines. Our vaccines and chemotherapies for these diseases are what in combination with other measures will, um, will save us from mosquitoes. Wow, vaccines, that's, uh, I, I guess I hadn't really considered vaccines in the context of mosquitoes, and that maybe that's a good segue into a question for you, uh, Christian, where um, it seems, I think there's a couple of people who are interested in understanding how vaccine specificity works. Can you 
for example, there's a question about can the COVID-19 vaccine also protect against other viruses like HIV? So perhaps you can help clarify um, a little bit around the uh, mechanism of, va of vaccines. Right. Yeah, so that's a, that's a very, very important question. What is the distinction between an antibody therapy and a vaccine? And so that goes back to another feature of our immune system and actually goes back to the memory. So when we have an antibody treatment, antibodies have a, have a half-life. So it's like any other medication. If you give people an antibody, you inject it, for example, um, the half-life will be several weeks. Um, there's ways of um, increasing that half-life, but after a couple of weeks, the antibody will be gone. What a vaccine does, um, we're not actually giving the antibody product, but we're giving something that will actually stimulate our own immune system to produce those antibodies. And to produce those antibodies, as I mentioned briefly, when we have this, when we, when we stimulate our immune system to do that, it will not only produce those plasma cells that actually produce the antibodies, but it will also produce those memory cells. So we will have those for a very long time. Uh, and in case um, we encounter the real thing again, um, or again, or we will encounter it for the first time, these memory cells will be the ones that are actually producing antibodies uh, and they will produce them. And usually memory cells are very long lived. Uh, and so um, it depends on the vaccine and with the COVID-19 vaccines, there were a lot of questions about the longevity um, of memory B cell responses, but some vaccines, uh, for example, you give it once and then you're protected for the rest of your life because you have very, very long lived memory B cells. And those are the ones that will always produce those antibodies. But the other question, Jeannie, that you raised is, can the COVID-19 vaccine cure HIV? And it's also, we can explain this by features of the immune system. And one very, very important feature of the immune system is this, this question of specificity. So be highly specific. Our immune system really, and antibodies also, detect very, very specific parts. Um, and so cross-reactivity, what we mean by that is um, that one, for example, the virus that is causing COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, would antibodies that are elicited to this virus um, cross-react with this HIV virus, with HIV? Uh, and usually our immune system uh, has ways of preventing that because it's a very, very targeted response, um, which is important to, to not have any collateral damage in our own body. Um, and so um, cross-reactivity between those two viruses are highly unlikely, and you would not see an effect of the COVID-19 vaccine um, on HIV infection. Thank you. Um, Jeremy, there was an early question about, um, it, it, I think there was a lot of interest in TB being an ancient disease and how it's sort of learned to evade macrophages, uh, you know, from engulfing them and then destroying them. So can you talk a little bit about the evolutionary arms race that might be taking place between macrophages and TB um, and whether or not the sort of ancient histories of TB as it evolves can inform anything moving forward for us as we think about the evolutionary arms race that might be taking place with other um, host pathogens? Uh, yeah, it's a really interesting uh, question. And then one that's a, a very active area of research in, in my field. Um, and it's unlike, for example, uh, COVID, which is mutating quite rapidly uh, to evade our immune system, uh, you don't really see evidence for that in TB. It will mutate to become resistant to the drugs that we use to try to kill it. Uh, but it's already quite good at evading being killed by our own immune system. And uh, in fact, if you, if you look at the bits of TB that are uh, recognized by the T cells that Christian brought up, they're actually hyper-conserved. They don't vary across TB. And the idea there is that uh, the uh, TB needs the immune system in order to transmit. Uh, when you cough and you produce these uh, respiratory droplets that contain the bacteria, uh, in order for that to happen, the immune system is actually destroying the lung in the process of trying to kill the bacterium. So um, it, for sure, TB is is mutating, but it, it's not clear that uh, it's mutating in a way, uh, at least not anything like COVID, to evade the immune response. It needs the immune response in order to transmit. 
So in terms of the um, treatments that people are receiving, either for tuberculosis, which is still impacting many in our population, and then also, Christian, some of the diseases that you're studying, with HIV and um, and COVID-19, there was a question in the question box about um, access. Can you talk a little bit about how the, the basic science might be um, sort of impacting the ways in which the treatments that people are discovering in the basic science world, how that's then being distributed and whether or not that distribution, if you're familiar, has equitable sort of undertones or not? Yeah, that's, I mean, um, especially for antibody-based treatment, that's that's the point that's being raised very often because in general, antibody treatments are um, compared to smaller molecules, which are like other antiviral medications, are more difficult, have a um, higher um, cost to production. Um, and then that these things always complicate um, uh, equal distribution across the globe. And, and unfortunately, then usually are in... Um, in countries um, or higher income countries um, are better distributed there. The thing is, I mean, for the basic science, I think, and we've seen parts of it um, in the last two years, the more need there is and the more science there is done, um, the, the higher or the quicker um, costs can go down, the, the better production um, lines can be done. And these things are, the more they're used, the more valuable they are, or the more, the, the more they are, um, in general, really needed for clinical treatments, then there usually is, um, is a way of bringing the cost down. But um, of course, it's always a function of how easy are they to produce. Uh, and it's, um, um, these are policy decisions that are behind that too. Um, um, and it, it depends on who uh, are the players? Are there pharmaceutical companies involved? Can they be distributed through um, uh, through, through foundations, through other agencies? So um, this is it's a it's a complicated question, um, but um, especially regarding antibody treatments, um, I think there there might be an option to bring bring down the cost. The more they are used, the more knowledge we have about them, um, the easier production gets. So that's that's one chance in the future. Yeah, most of the, the drugs used to treat drug-sensitive TB were discovered many decades ago. So they are, are relatively uh, cheap. Oh, it, as TB becomes more drug-resistant, it, it becomes very expensive to treat. I mean, I think in the United States, it's something like $500,000 or $200,000 to treat a drug-resistant TB case. So uh, this is beyond my area of, of expertise, but it's, you know, Pharmaceutical companies, many have exited antibiotic discovery in general because the the financial returns just aren't there. But this is an area where public-private partnerships and things like the Gates Foundation are, are I think, making a lot of headway in, in trying to get these drugs discovered and distributed more equitably. Great. Well, we are at time. Uh, Doctors Vossel, Brock, and Gabler, this has been a phenomenal uh, session with you all. Um, thank you for giving such wonderful talks and spending extra time uh, participating in our Q&A session. So to all of you who are attending, a link to the recording of this lecture will be sent to all registrants in the coming days. And please feel free to share with your colleagues, friends, and family members. Thanks again for joining us for this year's Talking Science. It is my great hope that we will be able to welcome guests back to campus in 2023 for our next event. Uh, and for now, I hope you all stay safe, remain healthy, and keep learning about those viruses because they are fascinating, fascinating things. So have a wonderful evening, everybody.